In July of 2009, if you had Googled United Airlines, the third highest search result would have been United Breaks Guitars, a video that I put up onto YouTube. And why is that remarkable? Well, it's remarkable because I'm a regular guy just like you. And because most of what I'm going to tell you was not designed in any way. Can I get a show of hands of who, who here in the audience has had a bad airline experience or knows somebody who has? Exactly. <laughs> and that means that we have something in common. And that kind of relatability has fueled one of the most successful customer service complaints in history, I'm told. If you have vid a video up on YouTube in a given month and it does something outstanding, they award it what they call honors. And in July of 2009, United Breaks Guitars had a lot of honors. It was uh, the number one most watched music video in the world for the whole month of July. But more interesting than that, it was the number six most watched video of any kind uh, in the world on YouTube that month. So it had become more than uh, just a music story, it had become a social statement. And since then, Harvard has done a case study on this that they've been doing for the last few years. I thought and more interesting than that was a grade one class in Pennsylvania followed me for a year to study what uh, one person can do with not a lot of money but some passion. Every general in the United States military, I'm told, has studied this. And my question to them was, are they upset by it? Right? And the coolest thing that's ever happened to me is that I was a $1,000 question on the game show Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Trebek said my name. So it's changed my life uh, instantly and forever, and it had effects in other areas like customer service and branding and social media. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about the video, so in case you haven't seen it, I'd like to run just a little bit of it for you now. I flew United Airlines on my way to Nebraska. The plane departed Halifax, connecting in Chicago's old air. While on the ground, a passenger said from the seat behind me, My God, they're throwing guitars out there. The band and I exchanged a look, best described as terror, at the action on the tarmac, and knowing whose projectiles these would be. So before I left Chicago, I alerted three employees who showed complete indifference towards me. United, United, you broke my Taylor guitar. United. Should have flown with someone else or gone by car. Cause United breaks guitars. Thank you. So that's United Breaks Guitars, or a little bit of that. So, how did all this begin? Well, back in March 31st in 2008, I was traveling for the first time, ironically, with United Airlines from Halifax up in Canada. And we were going to Nebraska for a one week tour. And we landed in Chicago right here to uh, catch a, a connector. And so we were waiting to deplane. And there was a woman sitting behind our bass player, Mike Hiltz, across the aisle from me. And she didn't know we were musicians, but she looked outside the window and said, oh my God, they're throwing guitars outside. And we were alarmed by this. And so I tried to talk to the flight attendant and she directed me to the lead agent outside. And that woman walked up and into the airport. She didn't want to talk to me. And inside the airport, there was a woman from uh, United out of Wicket and she was about to make a phone call. And I interrupted her and I said, excuse me, they're throwing our guitars outside. And she just said, but hun, that's why you signed the waiver and started making her phone call. And it turned out that my $3,500 Taylor guitar, very much like that one, was really badly damaged. And I bought that guitar when I didn't have $3,500, so it meant a lot to me. And I tried to get United to take some responsibility for that for eight months. I called the good people in India, and they weren't able to help me. And I uh, called people here in Chicago, I called people in New York City, there were emails, and either people wouldn't help, or they or weren't empowered to, or they couldn't. And, uh, and so it was a really frustrating thing. I was caught in that customer service maze. Eventually, I ended up having contact with a customer service rep here in Chicago. And she and I had about 10 email exchanges. And ultimately, she, she said, Mr. Carroll, we're not responsible for the damage to your guitar because you didn't open up a claim within 24 hours. 
And so I was really frustrated. So in real time, I started typing to her and I said, uh, if I were a lawyer, I would sue you, but I'm not. I've got other tools at my disposal. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do three songs, and I'm going to make three videos about my experience with United Airlines. And I'm going to post them to YouTube, and I'm going to try and get a million hits. I was just doing this in real time. I had no plan. And I said, I'm going to post them to YouTube, and I'm going to try and get that million hits in one year with all three videos combined. I said, you don't need to respond to me like you promised you wouldn't. I'll keep you tabbed on the progress. So when that first video goes up, you can watch it, and together we can get to a million that much quicker. <laughs> right? And that's what I did. So it took a while, but uh, seven months later, uh, thanks to the donated efforts of my friends in the music business and in the film business, and uh, just friends who were acting in the, vi in the video, for $150, I was able to uh, create a video and post it to YouTube on Monday, July uh, 6th in 2009. And I put it up at 11.30 p.m. I went to bed at midnight, and I had six hits 30 minutes later. And I thought all six were mine, right? Because I was going to watch it a million times if I needed to. <laughs> I was prepared. And I just didn't realize it, but social media had already started to work for me. So when I woke up in the morning, I had 300 hits. And then by lunchtime, I had 5,000. And by dinner time, 25,000. So by uh, Wednesday of that week, it really actually started to be a uh, full-on media frenzy. And you can't imagine what that's like when you're not expecting it. The interviews were coming in like crazy. I was getting up, I was doing interviews from like 7 in the morning and throughout the whole day until the evening, 11 at night. And then I would go to bed for two or three hours and I'd wake up and do the European morning circuit starting at 2 in the morning. And so it was really tiring and really exciting at the same time. <laughs> and I learned really quickly that depending on who was covering the story, you might be more or less interested in this. And so, for instance, when I was in Rolling Stone magazine, my musician friends were like, dude, it's Rolling Stone, <laughs> right? For me, being on the Situation Room on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, that was kind of a turning point for me. Because I came home and I'd been doing all these interviews and my house was filled with people that were celebrating for me and saying, this is great, and everyone's hugging everybody and eating finger sandwiches, you know, the, the food of funerals and weddings and celebrations like that. And, uh, I turned on the TV and there taped was this, this interview that I'd done. And Wolf Blitzer was declaring to the world that this wasn't a story, this was a situation, <laughs> right? <laughs> and there are my friends and they're with their sombreros and they're, they're singing their guts out on the situation room wall screens. And Wolf Blitzer himself, he's rocking out. Wolf's going like this. <laughs> so I thought that was really cool. And my parents have always been really supportive of everything we've ever done. And they were very proud when all this happened. They'd say, oh, we're proud of you. That was CNN. That's big. But after about six months, I finally got a call one day from ABC television, and they asked if I wanted to go on The View with Whoopi Goldberg and the ladies. And that's my mom's favorite show, hands down. So before I even called to say I'd be on the show, I called my mom on the phone. I said, Ma, I got big news. I'm going to be on The View next week. And there was this sort of like dead eerie silence. And she's never one to, uh, at a loss for words. But there was a silence, and then, holy fuck. <laughs> it turned my mother into a potty mouth, right? And my dad's like, wow, I'm proud of you. So about a week after that, I come home, and I do a, an interview with Reader's Digest, they called. So I did that, and I called home, and I was talking to my mom about other things, and I said, mention to dad, I did an interview with Reader's Digest. And he never talks on the phone, but he called back right away, as excited as I've ever heard him. And he's like, Reader's Digest, son. This is huge. This is going to help your CD sales. <laughs> <laughs> so the story went far and wide, and it, and it changed my life. Uh, in the last uh, four years, music is no longer just my main passion. It's, it's my favorite, but I do other things now. And I'm a published author and I get to travel the world. I tell this story and the lessons learned in different ways all over the world now, and I really like that. My partners and I, we've started two internet startups uh, through this experience. One Dave mentioned is, uh, is called Gripevine, and that's for people with uh, consumer gripes that don't feel that their voice is being amplified. And we can take that and we take it and send it to companies so that they can be notified of what people are saying and have a chance to engage with them. The other one is called Resolution One, and that's to help companies who are trying to stay engaged and trying to do the right thing and want to be involved but still want to do their everyday business stuff. And so we give them the tool to turn their listening into hearing and help them that way. So that's resolution one. But it didn't just affect me. All of this stuff didn't just affect me in my career. It also started uh, having effects in other areas because in September of 2009, BBC announced that United Brakes Guitars had dropped the market capitalization or the stock price of United Airlines by 10% or $180 million. 
And that sent ripples across boardrooms everywhere because one person was able to uh, take a bad customer service experience and share it with 150 million people and in the process affect the profitability of one of the world's bigger brands. Partially because of the video, since then companies are investing in social media and they're engaging with customers in a way they haven't before and they're thinking about how they do customer service differently for the first time. So it's, it's been really kind of exciting to be part of that. Now when Dave uh, Mason asked if I wanted to be part of Cusp, I was really excited because I had never really considered United Breaks guitars from a design perspective before. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized I had certainly followed certain design principles that were, I think, are present in other designs. And I'd like to talk about three of them with you today. Everything that we have ever said or done first began as a thought. And so you could argue that the quality of your design is uh, directly proportional to the scope of your big idea. They say garbage in equals garbage out, and I think that's true, but so is the opposite. So the best designs, I think, are the ones that allow you to think in limitless terms. You've got to think big. I believe that everybody has the ability to have a big idea. We all do it. We all have the capability. And I can't tell you how many times I've come across people who say, Dave, I loved the video. I had the exact same idea as you did, though I just never got around to doing it. And so I think part of the thing is on the follow-through. And people don't follow through perhaps because the uh, idea isn't as big as they thought it was, or they don't have the confidence that it was, or success is too far off, or it's too narrowly defined, or there's going to be impediments in the way that they just don't have the energy or time that they want to put into navigating it. And so rather than uh, get into a headspace where you, you live in a world where everything is possible, we start convincing ourselves and we create limiting possibilities about what's possible based on yesterday's news, our past experiences, and we actually start to balance and compromise our big idea with what we think is realistic. Who here has ever done that? Me too. I think the answer is to get rid of the compromise altogether, just reject it completely. And in my case, that's what I did. And I started asking myself a couple of questions, like why not? Why couldn't this idea that I had do something? And the more important question, is why not me? Why couldn't I do this? And so I started thinking about all the reasons why it could work. And I convinced myself that my friends and I could develop great content. We could do that. Distribution was my issue. It wasn't talent or ability. So I started thinking about going to YouTube because YouTube was a space where millions of people were coming in a very democratic way to watch only what they wanted to watch and share with their friends, only those things that they felt were worth watching. So I spent all of my en energy starting to think about what I could do to make something that was fresh and worth stopping by to watch. And so I came up with three criteria. For me, the three criteria that would make a difference in the success of this video would be that it would have to look good, it would have to sound good, and it would have to be remarkable. And by that I mean it would have to be something that would make people want to tell their friends about it. And this list actually is the comprehensive social media strategy design of United Breaks Guitars. That was it. That's what I did. Now, the second design principle that I think made a difference in the success of United Breaks Guitars deals with compassionate design. Compassion is defined as the deep awareness of the suffering of somebody else and the wish to relieve it. And when I talk about compassionate design, I'm talking about considering whether your design can help somebody else or the world around you in a way that's completely separate from any benefit that you would ever gain yourself. And then to instill that intention into the DNA of your big idea. This is a choice that we make. We can choose when we're doing things to undertake uh, strategies that help only ourselves or have a narrow uh, benefit. And I think that can be done effectively. That can be an effective design. But we can also choose to do things that help other people or the, or the greater good and help ourselves and maybe make a lot of money. But those are two different things. And you can invest uh, the same time and energy in that second one. Because I think the difference between just an effective design and a truly great design is the presence of compassion. And it doesn't need to take more effort to do this. It actually takes less because caring is not only free, but it's contagious. And if you do something to help other people, others are going to step forward and they're going to help you. And you're going to en end up being able to create innovations to your design that you never would have had on your own. You're going to have a better product by including other people. And that was the case with me. I ended up writing a song that brought people together. It made people want to be part of it whether they were uh, filmmakers or actors or, or musicians or just the people who chose to watch the video and take part in it. And so in a very real sense, I'm here today not because I did something great. I'm here because something amazing happened around an idea that I had. And in the process of writing United Breaks Guitars, from a compassionate standpoint, I was, I was able to reduce the frustrations of millions of people around the world by accident, and uh, it wasn't something that I designed. So I had the big idea. Uh, I was free of limitations, I injected caring into it, and it was the third design principle, I think, 
that really made and gave United Brakes Guitars the opportunity to be truly successful. And this has to do with choosing your optimum perspective. The best designs, I think, in the world are the ones that allow for success and growth and learning along the way, because true success is not about the destination. It's what you gain en route from your big idea towards your goal. And with United Brakes Guitars, I had the opportunity to choose how I was going to approach it. And when you're choosing your optimum pers perspective, I find that's the way the Olympics works. That's why I love the Olympics. All the athletes who go to the Olympics, they'd all like to win the gold medal, wouldn't they? But not all of them will. And can you imagine if it was only about the gold medal, what the uh, closing ceremonies would be like at the Olympics, how morose they would be, because almost everybody walking around would be feeling horrible. They'd be walking around like this, kind of feeling like losers, and I imagine they'd give them glow sticks so they could illuminate their sad, pathetic tears <laughs> as they're walking around wishing they had won the gold medal. But the Olympics aren't like that, because uh, they define success much more broadly. And I did the same thing with United Brakes Guitars. My goal, or my gold medal, was to try and get a million hits in one year with all three videos. But I had designed this to be much more successful along the entire process uh, before that would ever become a factor. I was going to improve myself as a songwriter, I was going to bring my friends together, and we were going to have just one good day to uh, experience something that we could laugh about for years to come. And I was going to try and write a song that might help other people. And if I could do any one or all three of those things, I was going to call this a success, no matter what happened, no matter how many people watched, and none of those things had anything to do with the views. And that's why I think I was able to be successful, because it never felt like work. Because I enjoyed the process so much, none of it ever felt like work. I had a really good experience at Disney World where I was reminded about the importance of choosing your optimum perspective. This is my family, and that's my wife Jill, and our two sons, Flynn and Fisher. At the time last year, Flynn was three and a half, and Fisher was only six months. And we were in Magic Kingdom one night, and we were going through, and we had, uh, we had the fast passes and everything. We had a great day, and it was getting dark, and we were going past the Star Wars simulation ride. And my son Flynn said, he was adamant, we got to go on this thing. And so I walked up to the sign, and there was a sign there, and it said, if you have a bad back or you get motion sickness, this ride is not for you. That's essentially what it said. And I do get motion sick, but I thought, this is Disney World. It's the happiest place on Earth. What could possibly go wrong? Right? <laughs> And so uh, Flynn and I start walking, we got the fast passes, no lineup. We start walking on this ride almost like it's in slow motion, like we're heroes in the making, and we're raving at the women that we love, in this case the same woman, but that's all right. <laughs> and we walk directly onto the ride into this booth that holds 15 people, and we sit down, and we got to put the seat belts on, and they give us 3D glasses, so we put those things on. And the ride starts, and immediately I start feeling car sick, and I'm motion sick, and it's awful. And I'm trying to do everything to make it stop. I'm closing my eyes, that's not working. I'm turning my head sideways to negate the 3D effect. That's not doing anything. I look over at Flynn and he's being thrown around like the rest of us, so it's every man for himself, <laughs> right, until this thing's over. And finally, when it ends, I'm feeling awful. And so I look down at him and I said, I don't know about you, Flynnie, but I feel kind of sick. How are you? And he looks at me with those 3D glasses and he's like, I pooped. <laughs> <laughs> but... Just a little, he says. <laughs> and that's the difference between someone who's 44 and someone who's almost four, because children will always see a qualitative difference between pooping in your pants a little bit or a whole lot, right? And so we get up off the ride and we walk out, and we've only been gone three minutes, so my wife can't believe it, and I look like I've been, just got out of the drunk tank for a whole night. And Flynn's got the gait of someone who's just pooped his pants. <laughs> So she says, Flynn, what happened? Did you poop your pants? And he says, yes, mummy, but we were in space. <laughs> so we were on the same ride. We had, uh, you know, the same di wildly different experiences because we chose different perspectives. And so the moral of the story is in this question. The next time you're going to design anything, are you going to uh, care about it enough? Are you going to think big? And when shit happens, as it always does, <laughs> Are your pants going to be half full or half empty? <laughs> they say, uh, dance with the one that brung you, so I'd like to do a song if I can. And uh, I think it's kind of relevant today because uh, there were so many great things that happened during uh, United Breaks Guitars, but when you design things and you don't try and worry about every little uh, thing that happens, sometimes you find these un unintended consequences. And uh, I wrote this, this song before United Breaks Guitars, but uh, so many people like this, the United thing that sometimes they came across other ones. And I got an email one morning from a woman in California, 
And she said, Dave, uh, I'm from California, it's 8 a.m. I just got home from the hospital where my mother's been in palliative care for a long time. And I wanted to tell you that she was a huge fan of United Breaks Guitars. She listened to it all the time and everything, and uh, it, uh, it always made her laugh. And she watched it many times a day, and she said, i got to hear what else this Dave Carroll has written. And so she ordered a CD, and uh, she came across this song called Now, which is about living in the present moment. And she listened to it again, and it became her favorite song, and it really got her into a peaceful spot. And she said, last night my mother said, put on uh, Dave's CD, and let's listen to it again. And while she was listening to it, she passed away. And you like to think that uh, when you, you write songs, that you, you, they mean something to somebody. And this song has found its way to a lot of people and, uh, who sometimes maybe need to hear it. And I'd like to uh, share it with you now. It's called Now. no way out there's still a way through so don't give up whatever you do surrender to moments and things as they are from the gaps in your catch 22s when there's no way out there's still a way Now's all there is So peaceful and still And now You don't worry about What's happened or what will Cause now never ends And now's never been And all of your answers Are waiting for you here Your whole world stands tough and weighing you down And you've had enough of this merry-go-round And your resistance to walls you won't move And running through old deja vus When there's no way out, there's still a is so peaceful and still and now you don't worry about what's happened or what will cause now never ends and now's never been and all of your answers are waiting When you don't understand how things got so far away from all you planned, and your life it feels so hard in your fragile house of cards, turn to your cornerstone when you're tired and feel alone to find your Now's all there is So peaceful and still And now You don't worry about What's happened or what will Cause now never ends And now's never been And all of your answers Waiting for you 